Um, I'm going to talk about the anatomy of vascular rings, and this is a particularly important because um, antenatally we've been detecting a lot more right arches um, in the last few years. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about that and, and then talk about our experience in Yorkshire and Humber of um, antenatally diagnosing right arches. Are, are, you, is, are the slides moving? Still on the first one. OK, right, let me. Uh... Now it's moving. Number four. OK, perfect. So. Um, is it big enough? We I'll just have to leave. It. I'll just yeah, have to leave it with a menu down the side. I think. So, the um, this is this is what we're talking about when we talk about vascular rings. This is the most common form. So this um, the image on the left, the normal aortic arch. You have your uh, left-sided aortic arch, your pulmonary artery, and this ductal ligament here joining the two together, and they're and both the aorta and the pulmonary artery are on the same side as each other and so the trachea and the esophagus are not involved. If you have a right-sided aortic arch with a left-sided arterial duct then you've got the potential here for the trachea uh, and all the esophagus to be narrowed in between the right aortic arch and the pulmonary artery where they're connected by the duct. Um, Katrina's already shown this um, a, a similar uh, diagram to this, and you made this the point, Sam. It's amazing that, uh, that the heart ever forms normally, given how um, complicated uh, the arch is. So six pairs of uh, uh, aortic arches. In fact, most babies don't have a fifth arch, um, and the arches aren't all there together. They develop from head to toe. So as uh, as some arches for, form, the previous arches are regressing and that's how you can get the different um, issues with the aortic arch. The most of uh, the arch anomalies that we're diagnosing, we diagnose um, on the antenatal scan and, and there's been a big increase since 2015. So you'll all be aware of the fetal anomaly screening programme. And bef before 2015, uh, there were four images that, that the sonographers had to take in order to confirm normal uh, fetal cardiac anomaly. One in the abdomen to show that the stomach was on the left with the aorta and the IVC, and then moving up to the four chamber view to show uh, balanced ventricles, balanced atria and the crux of the heart to show that there isn't an AVSD. Then moving up to the left ventricular outflow tract view to show the aorta coming off the left ventricle and that there was continuity here, uh, so no aortic override. And then moving up to um, the right ventricular outflow tract view, so showing the pulmonary artery coming off the, the uh, right ventricle uh, and crossover with the aorta going in this direction, the pulmonary artery going in this direction. And then in 2015, FASP suggested going up a little bit further to add this this fifth view, the so-called three vessel and trachea view. So as well as showing that the aorta came off the left ventricle and the pulmonary artery came off the right, uh, they wanted you to, to look higher up to see that the two vessels both went to the same side of the trachea. And so This is this. There's not. You don't need to see much of these fetal pictures, but this is just um, the three vessel and trachea view, uh, with the pulmonary artery bifurcating there, the aorta and the SVC, and then the normal three vessel view um, here with the pulmonary artery, the aorta, the SVC, and here we've got the trachea. So the pulmonary artery and the aorta are both on the same side as the trachea. And when FASP introduced that view, what we then found is that we were diagnosing a lot more uh, right-sided aortic arches. 
where the, the aorta is on the right hand side of the trachea and the pulmonary artery is on the left. And so this is an example of it antenatally. And you can see that actually it does look very different from the view where they both go to the same side as the trachea. And so once you do look for this and um, uh, you're expecting it, then you, you can see it quite easily. This is just a, a, another diagram. So the main uh, things that that we see this is a uh, so-called double aortic arch where you have a limb on the right and a limb on the left and then this is the the duct a right-sided aortic arch um, with the ductal ligament here attaching between um, either the subclavian in which case you don't get a vascular ring or the aorta in which case you do you can get vascular rings with a left sided aortic arch if your duct is on the other side. Uh, and and similarly, you can have different sorts of right sided aortic arch. So these are the various morphologies of vascular ring. And what we found was that in 2015, the year before uh, the guidance changed, we were referred three antenatal uh, right aortic arches. Uh, two of which were isolated and one was with a tetralogy. When the new guidance came in, um, we offered um, training to the sonographers, both in the south and the north. So um, uh, as a uh, fetal cardiology department, we offered training so that they knew what they were looking for. And as you can see, that uh, led to a big increase in the number of antenatal diagnosis of right aortic arches. So in 2016, the first year that um, the guidance had changed, we uh, diagnosed 18 uh, right aortic arches were referred to us. And then uh, in the three years following that, prior to the pandemic, we were diagnosing around uh, 40 to 45 right aortic arches a year, of which uh, between 30 and 35 were isolated right aortic arches. There's been a little bit of a fall off um, during the pandemic years, probably due to um, in the early stages where people didn't have their routine anomaly scans. But you can see a huge difference. We've got a tenfold increase in babies um, antenatally being referred to us with right aortic arches. So initially, when uh, these FASP guidelines uh, came into being, all of the fetal cardiology departments in the country um, suddenly saw this increase in their referrals for abnormal three vessel and trachea view. And initially, the, uh, there wasn't any clear consensus about how to counsel and how to investigate cases. There was one review uh, that had been published which suggested that for antenatal diagnosis of a right aortic arch, your risk of a chromosomal anomaly was around 5% if it was an isolated right aortic arch with no other cardiac or extra cardiac anomalies. And that rose to 10% if there were other anomalies such as tetralogy of fallow or extra cardiac anomalies. And the other thing that the review suggested was of antenatally diagnosed right aortic arches, the risk of needing surgery was around 25%. So this was how Shubra and I counselled those uh, patients initially. But we were also very clear with them that actually this was on the basis of published uh, literature in a slightly different setting from what we had um, because there, had, there was this sudden change and we were suddenly seeing a load of cases that we'd not seen before. What we also found was that through the country, people weren't sure how to investigate uh, these cases. So uh, on the basis that previously vascular rings would, were generally diagnosed by paediatricians in babies who either had stride or, or who had difficulty swallowing, uh, some centres felt that actually it should be the local paediatricians who were following these babies up to look for those symptoms. And other cardiac centres actually said, well, we've diagnosed them, we should investigate really fully. 
So, so some cardiac centres in the UK um, investigated all of their antenatal right arches with CT scans, barium swallows and bronchoscopy. Here in Leeds, we had discussions among the consultants and there was um, differences of opinion uh, as to how we should follow these patients up. And in the end, Shubra and I decided that since we were the ones diagnosing them, it would make sense for uh, to limit the number of people who were following them up so that Shubra and I would follow them all up ourselves uh, and would, would then um, it would help us to know with ongoing counselling what we should be saying. So we've now uh, obviously had five years worth of these antenatal right aortic arches. And pleasingly, there's a nice round 200 cases diagnosed between the 1st of January 2016 and the 31st of December 2021. Looking at the indications for referring them, uh, five of those 200 cases were referred because of family history and seven of them were referred because of a raised nuchal, but the 188 were referred because of an abnormal three vessel and trachea view noted on the anomaly scan. Of the patients referred because of a raised nuchal, one turned out to have trisomy 21. One was a suggestion of a left arch postnatally, although uh, I would doubt that. One patient turned out to have tetralogy of fallow and there were four isolated right aortic arches. And if the patients referred because of a family history, four had an isolated right arch and one postnatally had a ventricular septal defect as well as a right arch and went on to have surgery um, more because of the VSD than the right arch. So of those 200 antenatal um, cases, obviously we've said um, from the published literature uh, and it's interesting that um, in Katrina's um, prevalence of uh, 22Q in right arches, those would mainly be postnatally diagnosed ones. So of those 200, eight of them had extra cardiac diagnoses, uh, of which two of them had duodenal atresia and turned out to have trisomy 21. There were two abnormal kidneys, one tracheoesophageal fistula and a couple with uh, cerebral ventricular megaly. And after counselling, uh, almost 25% of um, the couples decided to have amniocentesis to check the baby's chromosomes. Of those um, uh, 48 patients, excuse me, <clears throat> the results were normal in 39 of them and they were abnormal in nine. So around a 5% uh, abnormality rate in those people who chose to have amniocentesis. Two of them uh, had uh, trisomy 21 and they both also had duodenal atresia. One baby was found to have Williams syndrome and one had a deletion in chromosome six and also had fallows. And then five of them had 22Q11 deletion. So as previous uh, literature had suggested, the most common uh, chromosomal anomaly in right arches diagnosed antenatally is 22Q11 deletion. And of those five patients, two chose to interrupt the pregnancy and one lady uh, returned to Slovakia, uh, which was where she'd come from. So we don't know the follow up on her. And we've got follow up data on two patients who continued. Postnatally, of those uh, 152 patients who chose not to have antenatal uh, diagnosis, um, there were an additional eight chromosomal anomalies, four babies with trisomy 21, a uh, baby with smith magenis one chromosome 8 inversion, one 6P deletion, and then a further 22Q11 deletion. So, Coming on to what happened with those um, 200 babies, well, we've, uh, there's 190 in whom we've got outcome uh, data. 10 of them had not delivered at the time when we looked at these. Um, and of those 196 had chosen to have a TOP. There have been five uh, early neonatal deaths or stillbirths, and two of the patients were lost to follow up. 
Oh, sorry. So of those uh, for follow up, four of them were felt postnatally to have a left arch, but there hasn't been 3D confirmation. And I've looked at uh, at least two of them, which I think are, are certainly right arches. Uh, there were 24 of those patients had tetralogy of fallow, one of whom was an AVSD and one a DORV. One baby with Vactual was born prematurely uh, and sadly died. There's been uh, four VSD closures and one arch repair and VSD closure. So we end up with 143 patients with no significant intracardiac abnormality that requires surgery. And of those, 27 patients have so far had surgery, uh, eight of whom were postnatally double arches. And we have four patients currently on the waiting list, two of whom are double arches and one uh, moved to another country uh, and was a double arch, which, which gives us a total of 32 patients out of the 143 who we felt had an indication for surgery. And that fits quite nicely with that published data of around 25% of patients, because there'll be a few patients who are still very young and will come to surgery in time. Of those 27 patients, the median age at surgery yeah, is around 217 days with um, obviously quite a big range. The youngest babies are ones who have double arches uh, with um, and with co-optation and the oldest ones are uh, children who don't have any airway compromise but do have problems with swallowing. And of those patients, the complication rate uh, is around a third, mainly chylothoraces. In the uncomplicated patients, then surgery uh, is, a, is uh, straightforward and there's a brief hospital stay, but obviously uh, much longer if you end up with a chylothorax, which um, can drain for a long time. So this has been quite an interesting time for Shubra and I because there was this uh, sudden change in the referral pattern to us as fetal cardiologists um, and something that we've really had to sort of navigate our way through. So I reflected on the possible good things and the harm of this sudden change in our patients. You could say that it's a good thing that you've got more opportunity for invasive testing for, for people who wish to, to um, have that. You could also argue that there's, there's that more invasive testing leads to harm because there is obviously a risk of miscarriage in um, in a small number of patients who have invasive testing. The, the good thing may be that there's more information for couples so that they have got more choice. The harm may be, again, more information for couples that where particularly in the early stages, we were uncertain as to what the outcomes were going to be with, for these babies. We're, I think we're much more uh, confident now um, about how we counsel people. The good thing was we can have prompt investigation if people do have symptoms and uh, potentially early relief of airway obstruction. The harm may be that we're over investigating babies who actually don't have any problems and uh, were therefore um, giving them the possible complications of surgery. What is certainly the case is that we've diagnosed double arches that must there must be double arches out there that were not previously diagnosed in the in the previous era. So in summary, we had a sudden increase in the in the antenatal diagnosis of right arch from 2016. We had initial difficulty knowing how to counsel the couples. The associated chromosomal abnormalities, the most common is 22Q11. We've got a large increase in antenatal invasive testing and a large increase in vascular ring procedures. And because of the uncertainty nationally, there is a national study going on. So, and we've provided our data for that, and that should report soon. Um, on all these outcomes in babies. So thanks to Sam for the fetal clips, to Stacey for providing me with the data and for uh, Pete who 
kindly looked at all of the post-op patients. Um, and oh, 